to thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here and happy birthday Jean Paul I will speak about cohomology jump loci uh, let me start with uh, the story with rank one local systems So uh, let's start with X. This can be uh, for the first minute any finite type CW complex. And uh, we're going to consider all the complex local systems of rank one on X. A local system is a locally constant sheaf. And uh, uh, this is going to be the space of all such uh, local systems. And this can be also identified with the homomorphisms from pi 1 to C star. And since C star is a billion, this is the same as the homomorphisms from the H1 Z to C star. So it's an uh, affine variety. A C star to the first Betty number of X uh, times a finite abelian group. So that's the moduli space of local systems of rank one. <coughs> Inside here, the cohomology jump loci, VIK. are defined to be those local systems and uh, uh, let's say maybe I should say rho as a representation such that the uh, dimension of the ith cohomology of the associated local system is greater or equal than k. So these are natural substrata in this uh, moduli space. And because of this finite, uh, uh, finiteness condition here, uh, it can be shown that these are af actually affine subschemes. There are precise equations for this VIK. I will not say too much about uh, singularities in this talk, but I want to make the connection now with singularities. Uh, let me start with, um, let me mention a few classical invariants. So if you have a germ of a holomorphic function, then we will denote by U F zero, the small ball complement of this hypersurface. So this is a small ball at zero in C N minus the zero locus <coughs> of the function. And we will consider a diagonal in, uh, inside the space of rank one local systems on this small ball complement. Now, this can actually be uh, described as C star to the number of uh, analytically irreducible components or branches of VF. And by diagonal, I mean uh, the diagonal in here. So uh, 
uh, once you have this description, you actually have uh, coordinates. So th this is the usual diagonal. Um, and to make things uh, uh, simpler, let's say f is a product of fi to, uh, let's say, just fi's, uh, such that uh, the fi are uh, reduced, irreducible, so this is locally, analytically, and distinct uh, um, hypersurfaces So in this case, if you have R of these guys, then this is C star to the R, and the, uh, the diagonal is the, 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 the usual one. If this is not the case, if for example, here you have some powers, then uh, for what I'm, going to have, what I'm going to say, the diagonal have to change a little bit according to those powers, but let's keep it simple like this. So. Here's the connection with singularity theory. The set of all complex numbers, lambda, such that, uh, let me just write, yeah, hi of the Milner fiber of f has an eigenvalue lambda. for some i. So this is the collection of all eigenvalues on the cohomology of the minor fiber of this polynomial. Let me call it E F zero. Then uh, this is the same as uh, those diagonal local systems with non-trivial cohomology. So let me write it like this. It's a diagonal intersected with the union of all VI1. So uh, this is why I'm looking at local systems. It generalizes, in some sense, the uh, notion of eigenvalues of uh, uh, the Milner fiber. So you have more elbow space with them. Uh, the uh, uh, main idea is this, that when uh, the space is special, the VI case, this cohomology jump loss, I have special properties. Uh, in this uh, 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 phrase right here, the special properties are, uh, the eigenvalues are roots of unity. So uh, from this point of view, the diagonal intersecting with all those VI ones uh, form torsion elements inside the moduli space of local system. And that's something that we're going to see throughout this talk. <coughs> Let me mention one uh, result of uh, Malgrange and Kashivara. <coughs> uh, who said that uh, if you look at the eigenvalues of uh, Milner fiber cohomologies for all the fibers, <coughs> then that can be computed by one single uh, algebraic invariant, the bernstein sato polynomial. So this is exp, by exp I mean e to the 2 pi i of the zeros of the so-called Bernstein-Sato polynomial. So V stands for variety, zeros. And the Bernstein-Sato polynomial, so this is the uh, generator of the ideal of polynomials in one variable S, such that BS F to the S 
is P applied to the FTDS plus one for some differential operator, algebraic linear differential operator uh, in the ambient space X. Uh, these are X1, da, 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 Xn, where in N variables, and also with polynomial behavior in S. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It, yeah, there's there's a uh, there's a local version for Bernstein Sato polynomials also. That's right. So this analytic function in this this polynomial. Uh, this polynomial is not analytic. No, I mean this P is an analytic function. Ah, yes. Okay, I I see what you mean. Yeah, in the analytic case, then this has then. Uh, uh, this portion has to be analytic, yeah, thank you. So yeah, that, here let's start with the polynomial. So this is quite surprising because it seems like they're completely unrelated things. Uh, on the other hand, this is what uh, computers understand and this is one way of computing algebraically the, Milner the eigenvalues of the Milner fiber nowadays. Uh, except from the well-known theorems of Milner in uh, uh, simple cases, uh, quasi isolated quasi homogeneous singularities that can be done by hand right now. Okay. So this is, but this is from the point of view of a local system. This is just a diagonal. So uh, let's see uh, what should go on for the other local systems. Let me denote uh, by capital F a tuple of polynomials. We'll stick with polynomials for simplicity. And small f, again, is the product of the FIs. So I have a conjecture which says that um, if you look at all the rank one local systems, uh, R. Yeah, sorry. So if you look at the small ball complement <coughs> and you look at all the local systems with non-trivial cohomologies, that's this set, then uh, if, uh, if you do this for all the x's and the zero locus of the polynomial, then this should be e to the 2 pi i of the zero locus of uh, an ideal in a bigger dimensional space. I'll call this the Bernstein-Sato ideal. Now, uh, uh, these guys sit inside C star to the R if uh, we have this condition up there that the, um, uh, the polynomials are reduced, irreducible and they form distinct hypersurfaces uh, locally at each point. Um, if that doesn't happen, then one has to uh, uniformize these guys because every point will sit in a different C star to a different R. But there's a way to uniformize these guys to make sense of this equality. Um, what is this Bernstein-Sato ideal? So this is the ideal generated by polynomials in as many variables as functions you have such that there's a similar relationship uh, to the one before. But now you involve the product of the FIs to the power SIs. And uh, you raise all of them by one. So for some algebraic differential operator as before, and now uh, with polynomial behavior, behavior in all these SIs. So of course, when R equals one, uh, it's just Malgrange and Kashivara, and we're, so I'm claiming that uh, yeah, there's a malgrange kashivara property for rank one local systems uh, in general. Um, however, uh, the result is a theorem only for one inclusion here. The other inclusion is uh, uh, boiled down to a statement about D-modules, which unfortunately are not uh, holonomic, 
and it's very difficult to prove, for me at least. Okay, so this uh, uh, pertains to uh, the question, how do we compute uh, eigenvalues of uh, Milner fibers, or how do we compute the cohomology jump loss I more generally? And that's one way to do things. Now, in a global situation, there's uh, a structure theorem that uh, I have done with my uh, postdoc, Botong Wang, and says the following. So if X is a smooth quasi-projective variety, complex algebraic variety, and, uh, and, and that's it, then uh, the VIKs are all finite unions of torsion translated sub-tori and this big torus of uh, local systems of rank one. So this was a conjecture of Boville for the projective case. Uh, it was proved uh, in the projective case by Green Lazarsfeld um, up to identifying uh, what kind of translate it is. Uh, it was shown by Arapura and Simpson finally that in the projective case, these are torsion translates. And uh, it was recently shown by Dimka and Papadima in the quasi-projective case that those components of the cohomology jump loci containing the trivial local system, so containing the identity, those are subtori. And using this result, uh, Botong and I were able to prove it. And in fact, the method that Dimka and Papadima used was very intriguing for us. And uh, whatever I'm going to say from now on is actually inspired by that paper. <coughs> so uh, uh, you see here, uh, in the global case, I mean global as opposed to looking uh, locally in small ball complements, uh, uh, a very strong property related to uh, the eigenvalues of the monodromy being uh, uh, roots of unity. Now, so what uh, Botong and I try to do after this is to try to understand the structure of this uh, VIKs, uh, not only for rank on local systems, and not only for the moduli spaces of uh, rank uh, of, uh, of local systems, but for all kinds of moduli spaces where we have a cohomology theory attached to those objects. And now I'm going to try to describe our results in that direction. So those pertain rather to deformation theory. So what do I mean by this? So let's, uh, let's take a moduli space, curly M. And I'm, go I'm going to be very vague about this, but then I will uh, state the precise results later. So uh, when you have a moduli space, and you have an object in there, rho, then deformation theory basically is the question, what's the local structure of this moduli space at the object rho. So you can pose this as what is the uh, analytic uh, uh, variety uh, represented by a locally at rho, or what's the formal scheme in, if you want to do algebraic geometry. 
and uh, um, the point of view that they were taking is that whenever you have uh, uh, objects that have a cohomology theory, then you can ask for the cohomology jump loci. What is the local structure of the cohomology jump loci? So this is here. This is infinitesimal deformation theory. And we like to call this one here uh, infinitesimal deformation theory with cohomology constraints. So again, this this should be defined similar as before, dimension of the H of the ith cohomology, that should be a vector space over the complex number, that that dimension should be greater or equal than k. Okay. Understanding uh, uh, local structure of moduli spaces uh, falls under a very general principle. due to the link. And uh, this principle says like this, any infinitesimal deformation theory problem is governed by a differential graded Lie algebra. I will abbreviate this as a DGLA. First, let me tell you what, uh, roughly what a DGLA is. It's a graded vector space, complex vector spaces, that has a differential, so this becomes a complex, and that has a Lie bracket. And the axioms that this Lie bracket satisfies, they're very similar with the usual one, except now they're graded. So there's, uh, uh, this is graded skew commutative, there's a graded Leibniz and a graded, um, uh, what's it called, um, Jacobi rule. So it's everything you want from a Lie algebra once you put on a grading and a differential in there. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but what does this mean? So uh, the, the Lin's principle uh, works like this: the moduli space might not actually be might not be defined, but the infinitesimal deformation problem is always defined if you switch to the point of point of view of category theory. So for infinitesimal deformation problem, you think of your moduli space, which might exist or might not exist, as uh, some geometric object. And if this is your object here and you want to understand things locally, then it's the same as understanding the maps from small curves into this moduli space passing through this object. So uh, algebraically, this means that you're replacing the geometric point of view with a functor from the category of Artinian uh, local rings, which are uh, uh, finite type C algebras, to sets. And uh, for any ring like that, the set that you get should be uh, geometrically, once you have the moduli space, you should think of it as the uh, homomorphisms, uh, as C schemes from spec of A to this moduli space and passing through the object row. Of course, this is algebraically, this should be uh, the set of homomorphisms as C algebras from whatever ring of 
uh, germs of functions at this point, or completion if you want, to A. So in practice, this is always defined, even if the moduli space is not. And now uh, Delin says uh, this functor is the same, so every time you have an infinitesimal deformation problem, you cook up a DGLA C like that, and this is the same as the canonical deformation functor attached to the DGLA C, which is defined for every Artinian local ring. Uh, you take the so called Maurer Cartan elements. up to gauge. What does this mean? So the maurer cartan elements are the elements of C1, tensor with the maximal ideal of this local ring, satisfy the maurer cartan equation, the differential from C extended by uh, identity on the ring A applied to omega, plus one half the Lie bracket of omega with itself. The Lie bracket from C extends to the whole uh, tensor here by using the usual multiplication on the ring A. That this should be zero. These are the maurer cartan elements. And there's a natural action of C0 on this space that you have to mod out. So let me let me mention, so of course, for this to be a useful principle, there has to be uh, 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 some flexibility involved, and this is the main theory of uh, deformation theory, that whenever you have two DGLAs that are equivalent in the DGLA sense, so equivalent means there's a zigzag of maps, these maps are DGLA maps, such that they are quasi-isomorphic as complexes. So whenever you have equivalence of DGLAs, the deformation functors are the same. So this is the central theorem in deformation theory. It, uh, it appeared before Delin in some sense to work of Schlesinger and Stashev and uh, Goldman and Milson, but Delin was the one who formalized this principle in a letter to Goldman and Milson, which is now available on the internet. Uh, whenever you have an infinitesimal deformation problem, obviously the happiest case is when the DGLA governing the problem is formal, which means that it's equivalent with its, with its cohomology DGLA, which has zero differential. There's two advantages to this. One, that in practice, the DGLA governing a deformation problem does not consist of finite dimensional vector spaces, but the cohomology is usually a finite dimensional complex vector space. And not only that, but the equations are not differential equations anymore. They're really algebraic equations, which uh, tells you immediately uh, that uh, when the DGLA uh, uh, governing the infinitesimal de deformation problem is formal, it tells you immediately that locally the moduli space has quadratic singularities. Uh, because these are quadratic equations if you uh, spell them out. So that's uh, quite strong. Uh, there's a Murphy principle at hand which says that uh, even if you stick with a very specific moduli uh, problem, uh, you can get basically any singularities in the world. That's uh, uh, Ravi Vakil's Murphy's law paper. So whenever you have a restriction like this, it's, it's amazing. It's a very special situation. Okay, so that's... Sorry? The main examples are when you have Tor, exact Tor, jump for the We do not have quadratic Smooth is also quadratic, because locally 
locally is given by uh, x equals zero. So uh, we, we, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anything up to degree two, that's why. Yeah. No singular, no equations at all is also quadratic. So uh, uh, the uh, MB that I put up there, uh, uh, if you run, if you run this. Uh, this down, there's really no equations to to work with, but that's also called quadratic. Yeah. But of course, this is not this. Uh, the local structure is not interesting for MB here, um, nor for for these guys because we know it now. They're smooth, and we know actually more than that. We know something global. But now I'm switching to the point where the local structure might be very bad. Uh, can we say something about that? Uh, with the idea of trying to do rank, higher rank uh, representations of fundamental group or uh, vector bundles, things like this. So let me state a theorem of Goldman and Milson. So I'm going to illustrate the formation theory with the two setups. This result is due to Goldman Milson and Simpson. And it says, if X is a compact Keller manifold, And uh, if you consider the space of rank n representations of the fundamental group, and if you take a semi simple representation there. Then the uh, uh, the uh, local the infinitesimal deformations of the semi-simple representation, or in other words, the um, uh, the analytic uh, germ of this moduli space at this representation, is the same as I'm going to lie a little bit here as those classes eta in the first cohomology on X of the endomorphism local system of the local system of rank n attached to your uh, semi-simple representation, such that eta wedge itself is zero in H2. And I'm lying here a bit because uh, the space of local systems uh, of rank n is not exactly this, but uh, you have to quotient out by uh, a conjugation here. And uh, when you do that, you have to change a little bit the presentation here, but uh, I'm gonna uh, sweep that under the rug. It did. So uh, for every representation, you have a local system attached to it. That's L rho, yeah. All right, so this has nice quadratic. So of course, the germ at zero of this. So we have a finite dimensional vector space. We have some quadratic equations. Uh, sorry? Uh, this, 
y let's see does the tangent con determine locally the v I don't know, does the I, I should know this question. Does the tangent cone, uh, uh, let's see. The tangent cone for me involves reduced equations, where, where, whereas this actually can be non-reduced equations and they give you, uh, although I presented this as a set theoretic statement, in fact, it's a statement, uh, you boil down the uh, deformation theory and you actually get equations, local equations for your variety. So it, I think it tells you more than the tangent cone. And the proof, I can say what it is now. So it's a local, it's an infinitesimal deformation problem. It should be governed by a DGLA. And the responsible DGLA here is the uh, Deram complex, the global Deram, the Deram complex of global uh, smooth forms with coefficients in the endomorphism. There's a natural way to, uh, um, to make this into a DGLA with the usual differential. And uh, because uh, the representation is semi-simple, this is basically due to Simpson, uh, you have formality. And this tells you that you can replace this DGLA with its cohomology DGLA. With zero differential. And therefore, the uh, differential uh, 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 disappears, and you're left with the quadratic equations. And the other example considered by, Nad by uh, Goldman Milson and also Nadel. So y you will see that it's very similar to this. So again, X is a compact killer manifold. And now you consider the moduli space M of stable rank N holomorphic vector bundles E on X with vanishing total churn class. And you consider one such uh, vector bundle in there. And uh, the infinitesimal deformations are again described by, now I don't have to lie, this is an honest statement. Uh, it's uh, uh, first cohomology classes with uh, coefficients in the holomorphic endomorphism of this line bundle, of this, sorry, vector bundle, wedging itself to zero. And the local um, picture at the origin uh, of this uh, subscheme in there. Uh, and again, so the proof after you, uh, you prove the principle in some sense, then is to display the DGLA governing this uh, uh, infinitesimal deformation problem. And here the DGLA responsible is the Dolbo DGLA. So these are the, go uh, the global, the complex of global zero Q forms with coefficients in the holomorphic uh, endomorphisms, and the differential is the Dolbo differential. And again, the situation is such that uh, you have formality, and the formality will allow you to replace it with the cohomology of this, which is exactly the cohomology of the endomorphisms. And uh, uh, again, the differential is going to be zero. So uh, this is what Goldman and Wilson have proven in their paper. And then they leave notice, hold on, all these problems can be explained via this principle that I just mentioned to you. So what we did is to come up with an enhanced principle for dealing with the cohomology jump loss sign.
So for infinitesimal deformation problem with cohomology constraints, um, we have a new principle. Every infinitesimal deformation problem with cohomology constraints is governed by a pair of uh, DGLA together with a DGL module over it. So, so every time you have an uh, infinitesimal deformation problem, you have your DGLA. That's, um, in some sense, that's, uh, it, it takes some expertise to cook up the DGLA, but okay, you have it. And then you consider for any choices i and k, you consider the, the strata in there, the vik's, and we are saying that this is governed by one single module over this DGL A. There's a natural uh, uh, way to define what the module over a DGL A is. I'm going to skip that technical part. Um, how is this governing it? So the VIK, the local structure at row, so I've got, again, we're going to change the, point, the geometric point of view to the categorical point of view. This should be the same as something that we have defined. These are sub-deformation functors, def i k, pertaining to these pairs. These are sub-deformation functors of the DGLA C that take an Artinian local ring and give you uh, the maurer cartan elements, of course, because that's the sub-functor here. but with an extra condition now, pertaining on i and k, g i k, so this is what I call the cohomology jump ideal, and I'll say something about it soon. The cohomology jump ideal of the complex that you get from M tensor with A by adding to the uh, differential of M the wedge of omega, that this should be zero. So these are maurer cartan elements plus some condition. But the line also should be zero. That's right. That should be zero. Thank you. And uh, uh, again, we have to mod out by the gauge. So the point is that this makes sense, what I wrote here. So we have this, with, with this definition, now we can understand the local structure of cohomology jump loci. So, of course, you want some flexibility, and we have similar statements, namely that you can make sense of what a DGLA pair uh, means to be equivalent with another DGLA pair. And again, it boils down to a zigzag of quasi-isomorphisms between uh, the pair. Uh, if you have an equivalence, then this sub-deformation functors should be the same for all i and k. And such that you're very happy when uh, you are in the formal case, namely when the DGLA pair that you start with is equivalent with its cohomology DGLA pair. And you're happy in this case because, uh, first of all, we know that the maurer cartan equations boil down to quadratic equations. And then uh, uh, also, these uh, cohomology jump ideals are much easier to compute. They become just uh, linear algebra. You deal with equations coming from minors 
uh, of a matrix that is uh, uh, you obtain from from linear algebra. Um, okay. So, uh, what is the cohomology jump ideal? I'm going to say just a few words about it. Uh, if you have a module over a ring, then the module comes with some natural invariants. Those are the fitting uh, ideals of the modules. You can define the fitting ideal starting from any presentation of the finite rank presentation of your module. Uh, and uh, you look at some ideals of minors in there, but you have to keep track of which minors you're looking at. Uh, uh, so when you pose yourself the question, how do we generalize this for complexes of modules over a ring, how, do we, how can you define invariants for complexes now? Then you get to the definition of the cohomology jump ideals. All right, so let's say, let me mention our results now. So uh, what I want to say is that after developing such a machinery, our results uh, are basically low-hanging fruit right now because uh, you have the DGLA here in these two types of situation, and there's an obvious module that they act on. The endomorphism must act on whatever endomorphism you are taking off. So, uh, and not only that, but you have formality for free. You don't have to prove any formality theorem. So here's some low-hanging fruit that we claim as theorems. So this is again with Boton Wang. Um, so X is a compact Keller manifold. The first is for the representation variety. So if, let me, if we choose a rank and representation of the fundamental group, which is semi-simple, and we define the VIK exactly by what you expect, namely those representations such that uh, the dimension of the ith cohomology of the attached local system is greater or equal than K, then uh, uh, the local structure at this representation, uh, at, this at this representation for the cohomology jump loci is uh, given by, uh, on top of the quadratic equations that you have there, just linear algebra. So this is etas, and again, here I'm lying a bit just because I lied there, etas in H1. such that eta squared is zero, and such that now you have the cohomology of the local system itself. That forms a complex when you wedge, when, uh, you wedge it with eta, because eta is a class in the endomorphism, uh, the cohomology of the endomorphism. And you impose the condition that the ith cohomology of this complex has dimension greater or equal than k. So this is what I mean by a uh, um, linear algebra uh, condition. 
Moreover, I'm not writing it here. I'm uh, showing this as a set. But uh, if you run the, the cohomology jump ideal argument, what you get is actually equations for the, non for the natural non-reduced structure on this cohomology jump loci. And in the second setup, um, so this pertains to the stable Rankin vector bundles with uh, a vanishing churn class. We define the, so we define some Hodge theoretic um, cohomology jump loci, VPQK. This consists of uh, uh, such uh, vector bundles such that the dimension of the qth cohomology of E tensor omega P is greater or equal than K. And the result is that the uh, local structure of this Hodge type cohomology jump loci is given uh, Again, very similar to what I wrote here, but now without lying. So eta is a uh, wedge with, with itself is zero, and then you have the complex H X cohomology of omega Q tensor L ten, tensor E. Sorry and you wedge with the eta, and that becomes a complex. And you ask that the cohomology of this complex, the ith cohomology of this complex, has dimension greater or equal than k. Again, uh, after you do the quadratic equations, the rest is a linear algebra. I'm not saying uh, the equations are easier here. Linear algebra means that you get some minors on some matrices. When n was 1, when the rank was 1, this is due to Green and Lazarsfeld. <coughs> and uh, yeah, how, how does the proof go at this point? Maybe I can use a previous blackboard. So, uh, You have the natural DGLA pair. In this case, this DGLA acts on the Deram complex of the uh, uh, local system itself. And this is also formal, so you can replace everything with the cohomology. And that's why you end up working with the cohomology of local system then. And similar here, the uh, DGLA pair, so this acts on the Dolbo complex of P is fixed and Q varies forms of the vector bundle itself. And again, there's no formality. There's no new formality to prove here. All, all follows from Simpson's work, and uh, that's how we get this local statement. That's all. No questions? Okay, so. Ah. Uh, so I'm not at all an expert. Uh, so, therefore, the question is it easy to get this uh, C uh, governing uh, the deformation? Um, this Lie algebra C? Not entirely easy. That's where the voodoo comes in. There's, n there's no. Uh, procedure that will spill the C out, except you have to do uh, work by hand. You, you have basically have to define what it means to have uh, infinitesimal deformation of your object. Once you define that, then the C will come out. Um, it, an informed guess, yeah. So uh, um, there is now a procedure for any coherent sheaf, I think even for complexes of coherent sheaves. Um, uh, of course, the moduli space does not exist in that situation, but you can always frame the infinitesimal deformation problem 
and you can write down what the DGLA is. This is uh, Manetti, I think, and some students of Manetti. Any other question? And thank the speaker again.